No dobrze. Myślę, że ja... Honorta jest... Jesteśmy na Facebooku? No, ładujemy się. Teraz zatrzymamy. No dobrze, więc ostatnie testy. Mam nadzieję, że mnie słychać na wszystkich kanałach. Na wstępie po raz kolejny podziękowania dla Michała Skoczyńskiego firmy RIDU za nasze tłumaczenie. To oni właśnie będą tłumaczyli naszą prezentację, więc mam nadzieję, że nas słychać i zaczynamy. Moi drodzy, witam Was bardzo serdecznie na kolejnym już wykładzie z cyklu Nurkowi Pomagajmy Sobie. Przypominam, że Nurkowi pomagajmy, pomagajmy Sobie to taka oddolna akcja, która ma na celu wspieranie branży nurkowej w Polsce. W linku pod tym wydarzeniem oraz w opisie na YouTube znajdziecie tak link do strony nurkowi pomagajmy sobie.pl, na której możecie wpłacić dowolne wpłaty, żeby pomóc centrum nurkowym i bazom nurkowym w Polsce w tym trudnym okresie, więc Będziemy bardzo wdzięczni za, za, te, za takie wpłaty, żeby naszą akcję trochę wspomóc. Więc po raz kolejny, kolejny wykład z takich kwestii organizacyjnych, tak jak ostatni nasz wykład Simona Michela, ten również będzie tłumaczony symultanicznie. Tu na Facebooku będzie transmisja z, z tłumaczeniem, natomiast jeżeli ktoś chciałby w oryginale tego słuchać, to zapraszamy na nasz kanał na YouTubie. Link też jest poniżej do tego kanału na YouTubie gdzie możecie oglądać tą transmisję w oryginale. A kto będzie naszym dzisiejszym gościem, to już Wam powie Michał. Dzisiaj gość, który jest całkiem dobrze znany polskiej publiczności nurkowej, bo ustalaliśmy to z nim przed chwilą, ale był w Polsce co najmniej 20 razy prowadząc różnego rodzaju projekty oraz prezentacje przy okazji różnego rodzaju konferencji. Dzisiaj naszym gościem jest Phil Short, który jest zawodowym nurkiem od ponad 30 lat. Wykonał ponad 6 tysięcy nurkowań w swojej karierze i spędził na rybriderze ponad 3,5 tysiąca godzin. Wszyscy, którzy nurkują na rybriderze wiedzą, że to naprawdę, naprawdę długi, długi czas. Phil zaczął swoją karierę jako grotołas i dopiero później został nurkiem, w bardzo respektowanej British Cave Diving Group. Pracuje jako Dive Safety Officer, czyli osoba odpowiedzialna za bezpieczeństwo w różnego rodzaju projektach naukowych, które wspierają głównie badania archeologiczne. Jest też członkiem Explorers Club, to bardzo elitarny, elitarny klub dla odkrywców. Jego Pasja to nurkowanie wrakowe, a szczególnie eksploracje wrako, e, przepraszam, jaskiniowe, ale dzisiaj akurat opowie nam o wraku. Phil, stage is yours. Hi, um, good evening and thank you for the invitation to speak at this uh, virtual conference. It's uh, very good that we can all be involved in trying to inspire each other and keep enthusiastic, ready to return to the water when we can dive. In the UK, we're still not able to as yet. But thank you for the invitation to speak this evening and thank you for all of those that you have, have tuned in to watch. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about this evening is a project that I was involved in last year that's an ongoing project that will continue for at least the next five years to survey and excavate a very ancient ship in the Baltic Sea. So I'm just gonna screen share with you now to give you the pictures to go with this. And uh, if anyone has any questions, please uh, put them in through the chat system and the guys will be making note of them. And there'll be facility at the end of the talk to answer any questions on this project or anything else that you have relating to diving, caving, cave diving, or anything uh, along those lines. So hopefully you can stay to the end with some questions. So the Gripschenden is an ancient ship. She sank in 1495. 
she was the ship of the king. And at this time, the area where she sank was part of Denmark. It is now part of Sweden. So she's a very, very old ship, older than the Mary Rose, older than the Vasa, older than the Mars. Um, the interesting thing about her is that it was unknown exactly which method of ship architecture was used to build her. And also it was idealized that because it was the king's ship, she would be carrying some really rather precious and important cargo. So this was something we were hoping for. The picture you can see on the first slide here is a long way into the project. We were on site for approximately five weeks. We were diving almost every day once the site was set up. And what you can see here is one of our archeologists. This is uh, Professor John Adams from Southampton University in the UK um, on open circuit and myself on CCR as his guardian. And our system um, within the commercial archeological projects that we have put together over the years is each uh, scientist has a buddy who is a guardian who is basically there to do heavy tasks, to lift, to move, and to look after the scientists. It's a system we've used on other projects such as the Tulsa American, Second World War bomber, and the Antikythera mechanism shipwreck over the last seven years, and works very well with an extremely good safety record. What you can see at the front of the picture is the timbers of the side of the ship. So the side of the ship here um, is basically in this particular photo, the starboard side and near to the back of the ship, uh, just in front of what was called a stern or back castle. This ship of this age didn't fire on other ships with cannon from a distance. This was the era of naval battle where the ships would come alongside, throw grapples and attempt to board each other and then have typical brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat. So a lot of the men on board were not sailors, they were Marines armed to board the other ship with a castle at the front and the rear, the bow and the stern, and engage in battle on board the ship they had boarded. The steel frame you can see around the two divers here is our archeological grid. It's marked out an area two meters by six meters. We were permitted to work on last year's season. And the tubes you see to the left are our water dredge which is how we excavate. And we'll talk more of that later on in the talk. The talk was a, able to carry, the expedition, sorry, was able to carry an Explorers Club flag. We had four fellows of the Explorers Club on the expedition, including myself. And the uh, beauty of these flags is they all have a history. They have been carried on previous expeditions around the world or beyond, um, both Apollo 11, and the other Apollo missions that landed on the moon carried Explorers Club flags. Um, the interesting story is the one from Apollo 13 went in the spaceship in the Apollo 13 capsule in a vacuum sealed bag, so it was small, and it came back still sealed in the bag because, as many of you will know, Apollo 13 did not land uh, because of an accident, but all men came back safe, and that flag is still in its space sealed bag in the Explorers Club now. So they hold quite a lot of pedigree and a lot of kudos towards a project if you're lucky enough to be awarded one. So back to the wreck, you can see here a small map showing the location. We have a small island here called Stora Ekon. So where we are is we're in the Blekinga Archipelago, which is part of the Ronneby Archipelago. So this is a, a little bit south and east of Lund which is just over the bridge from Copenhagen. And we're on the landward side in the lee of any storms or prevalent winds between the mainland and the island of Stora Ekon Island. And you can see here on this little map, there is actually a mark of wreck just above the Stora Ekon Island. The picture to the left is what's called a hawser. So on the front of a ship at the bow on the port and the starboard would be a circular hole through which the anchor chain passes down to the anchor so the ship can anchor in port, in harbour or under other circumstances. Now on a ship of this age, the anchor hawser as it's called was not a chain, it was a rope. And the rope went through the ship's side through this hole. 
So what we have here with a diver hovering above it is in this case, this is actually the starboard hawser. A short distance away to the right of the diver here is the port hawser, so left and right, and they're both there intact. And obviously between these two would be the bow spit or the very, very front of the wreck. With early wrecks, often with some sort of carved figure known as a figurehead on the front of the ship to help identify it. So the history a little bit, it was first dived in 1970 by members of a local dive club, the Doppingana Dive Club. They went in their boat out to dive some more interesting deeper wrecks beyond the island, but the weather on that day as us as wreck divers are all very familiar with was poor and we weren't able to go around to the other sites. So the club decided to dive in the shallows behind the island in the sheltered water. This is why it was an anchorage, um, just to do some training with their members. And they found timbers on the seabed and timbers and wood sticking out of the seabed. So they thought maybe this is something important. So in 2000, Jonas Formgren of Doppingana contacted Lars Einerson, the archeologist from the Kalmar County Museum, and asked him to come dive with them, look at these timbers and see if they re represented something important, if they were indeed a complete wreck, or if they were just loose timbers that had been put there by current or dropped there overboard from other boats. In 2006, archeological permission was given by the authorities to dig a test trench. And this basically means putting a grid of the specified size over the site and being able to then dig down gently and gradually to find out what is contained beneath the mud of the seabed. And from there, numerous artifacts were recovered, indicating that this was indeed a complete ship, not just some loose timbers. And one of the things they found was that figurehead, the figure carved on the front of the ship often to induce fear in the enemy or as a superstitious good luck token. But what you can see here, the underwater photo taken by Ingmar Lundgren, Richard Lundgren's brother, the two brothers that found and have been working on the Mars wreck for the last few years. And on the surface there, once it was lifted on this stretcher with strops to bring it to the surface. And what this is, is a griffin hound. So it's a sort of mythical, spiritual, horrific creature that is a dragon. And as you can see, it's holding a human head in its mouth. So in 1495, the people were very superstitious. They worried about everything, whether they would go to hell if they were bad. And suddenly out of the, uh, the mist comes sailing a ship with this dragon's head at the front, holding a human head. It's quite a powerful message um, to the enemy. And basically the force that owned Gribschunden and the king that was aboard Gribschunden in battle was King John of Denmark and Lübeck. So as we said, this area, Stora Ekon, at the time in 1495 was part of Denmark and it is now part of Sweden. Now here is the Griffin Hound, or it's often called Griffin Dog for simplicity after conservation. And the most important thing with a project like this is that the funding to make something like this happens is gonna sound a little strange. The funding has to be achieved in reverse. The first thing that must be funded is the museum building space to put the artifacts eventually. The second thing that must be funded is often the most expensive is the conservation of the artifacts. So they are kept in good condition to maintain the capsule of history. And then right back at the beginning, the third thing to be funded is the diving project, because there's no point lifting something like this, exposing it to oxygen in the air and having it rot away to nothing. It's actually safer on the seabed under the mud where it was. So conservation on something like this is a case of um, basically pushing the salt water out of the wood by spraying or soaking the artifact in a chemical called PEG, polyethyl glycol, which was used extensively on the conservation of the Mary Rose. And then in some cases, um, not on the Mary Rose, but on Gribschunden artifacts and other wrecks, after the PEG is inside the grains of the wood and the salt water is gone, the pieces are then freeze dried um, to secure them. 
Now, the only freeze dryer big enough for this figurehead was in the Copenhagen Museum and Universities. So she went back to Denmark, um, the owner of her originally in 1495 for conservation. And just recently, at the end of last year, after our project, she's now been delivered back to Ronneby, to the museum there, as the first of many artefacts that will be on display to the public from the wreck. Other things that were found in the 2006 test trench were these gun carriages. No guns, because they're currently researching exactly what happens, but there is a chemical reaction from the type of water and the iron, where the iron dissolves away to nothing. It's a bit like if you look at footage of the Titanic when she was first found, and the Titanic now, there are big rust stalactites hanging off of the Titanic wreck where bacteria are eating the iron. And eventually in a very short time, there'll be nothing left. The wreck will be completely gone. And the same happened here from 1495 till now, over 500 years, the iron guns have been eaten away but the wood has been preserved. These carriages are for a simple type of side breech loading cannon, not a muzzle loading cannon, where a magazine type affair was put together in iron with gunpowder and shot, loaded in the back of the gun, tied in place with rope, wedged in place with a wooden chock hammered in and then fired. And often what it fired rather than a cannon ball was loose shot and fragments to do as much physical damage to the soldiers on the ship they were now tied up against, having grappled. So really quite brutal warfare. There are at least two more of these on the seabed now. We know of their position, but they've not been lifted as yet. So the interesting thing is that um, when these carriages were recovered, they were then uh, analyzed by dendrochronology and this showed the wood to be from 1482 to 1483. So basically 12 years prior to the sinking. And the wood came from a part of Europe that is now part of France. So these days technology has moved on to such a degree that we can't just tell the age of wood from, for example, carbon dating. We can tell through dendrochronology um, the exact age of the piece of wood, what type of wood, and even where it grew, where it came from. The important thing with archaeology is what you're looking for is not just one great artifact like a silver coin or a cannon. You're looking for the whole story. So what we're trying to do here is each thing found must be recorded by every means possible where it was found so the whole picture can be put back together of how life was on this ship as a marine, as a sailor, as a cook in times of peace, in times of war, a time capsule of history. Early last year in April, we went for a reconnaissance dive on site just to get ready for the possibility of having permission for the project, which was in August and September last year. So in April, we went, many of you dived the Baltic. So April's not a particularly warm time. It was around two degrees water temperature, but it was crystal clear. Um, I jumped in the water first to wait for my buddy on that dive, which was Dr. Brendan Foley of the Department of Archaeology and Ancient History at Lund University. And in the water, I just rinsed my mask as you do, looked down, uh, the depth of the wreck was 12 meters. And looking down, I could see the whole layout of the ship, more or less from the bow to the stern, rudder, central keel, ribs, and everything in that clarity of water. We were very lucky when we went back in August, September, visibility could have been terrible, but the plankton bloom, the algal growth had died away and been carried away by current. And we had very good workable visibility as you'll see shortly throughout the project. Our base was the museum's live shipping museum, which is just literally across the water from Stora Econ and the wreck site, just outside of Ronneby town where the main museum is. And what they do here is they do classes and workshops in ancient shipbuilding techniques using the original tools, the original woods and the original methods. And the curator of the museum here, a wonderful guy, he basically builds these boats you see here. That's why they're included in the talk from scratch, not from parts. He steams the wood and bends it to shape. He carves it by hand tools as would have been used in 1495 and builds these beautiful small boats uh, because they don't have the facility to build full size ships. 
the sheds behind the boats in the right picture was our base. We were given one boat shed as our boosting, compressing, gas fill, blending center. And the big shed um, next to it was used for conservation. So we had conservationists from the museum on board the ship each day. Anything lifted went straight into conservation tanks of the seawater we were in, was brought back to land into bigger conservation tanks and darkness in these sheds and looked after day by day, item by item. So no delay of it being on the surface, absorbing oxygen, decaying and being damaged. Our vessel or our platform, it was the Swan. Now this catamaran is an extremely well equipped survey vessel. She's also the dive platform used by Rich and Ingmar Lundgren's team on the Mars wreck. So she really is custom built with electronic survey equipment and other paraphernalia to be a great working platform for wreck research. On our site, we were lucky. We were able to get a four point anchor system with concrete mooring blocks situated around in a rectangle, the outside of the footprint of the Gribschunden wreck. So when we went out each day in the Swan, we could just tie up to those four anchorages alongside a pontoon that we could leave out there each night um, and step off the boat to set up our generator and our pump for the water dredge um, and then work from the Swan. So it was a really comfortable working conditions. It was almost like not being at sea, tied up, engines turned off. We had a film crew with us, the same film crew that filmed our project in Viz, Croatia in 2017 to excavate and recover the pilot from the Tulsa American B-24J bomber. And this film crew from Nova, um, directed by Kurt Wolfinger, were incredibly sensitive. They make great documentaries, factual, not trash TV, really nice people to work with. So each morning for the benefit of the dive team, the benefit of the archeologists and for the documentary, we gave a very thorough briefing. Here on the left, we have uh, Professor John Adams of um, Southampton University, UK, uh, but who quite literally wrote the book on shipwreck architecture and structure. He was one of the divers and archeologists on the Mary Rose project. And he's briefing um, Brendan and Johan on the day's plan with the map of the site behind him. So we'd get everything briefed before we went out. So once we got there, we could just get in the water and start productive time. Now, this is an early map of site, and it's quite an amazing thing, as you'll see shortly, because this was done the old fashioned way with a tape measure, stainless steel tape measure stretched out over the site as a central datum point, and then transits off of that at 90 degrees to each artifact and a compass, slate and pencil. So really done the old hard way by hand by an archaeologist using cartography, survey skills and mapping. So really quite impressive, and you'll see how impressive in a moment. Uh, now, I don't have a pointer, but if you look at the red arrow, that is the area we were given permission to um, dig our trench during our uh, 2019 project. So our six metre by two metre trench was right where that red arrow points. Right over to the left of the picture, you'll see items seven and eight. Seven, uh, which looks a bit like a, a wrench or a spanner, with a hole in the end. That's the hawser for the anchor rope that you saw in the, in the second photo at the beginning of the talk, just to put it in perspective. So to the left of this map is the bow and right over to the right, there's a piece looks like a, a knife a little bit. That, that's the rudder. So this is the whole wreck laid out. Here's our trench. Um, basically, we built this from scaffold because the archaeologists like to, you'll see in the middle on the right, hang their fins on the frame once they get down there, hook their feet through the bars of the scaffold and hang upside down from this scaffold. Um, so they're resting on the scaffolding, never on the wreck and don't have to concentrate constantly about their buoyancy. So the guardians and commercial divers were on CCR and all the archeologists were on open circuit, plenty of time for them with uh, 12 meters of depth maximum, nine meters average. The scientists would average 90 minute dive times, that's 90 minutes bottom time, no deco. And the guardians would average uh, three hours per day, uh, basically working with two scientists, one after the other. The float you see above the open circuit diver in the middle is to make the water dredge neutrally buoyant. 
the orange pipe you see is the outflow. So anything sucked up goes down that orange pipe and away from the site. The gray pipe under the scientist's arm is the suction nozzle. So this is like a, a big vacuum cleaner for a house, but, but uh, um, much, much larger. And if you can just see the blue pipe parallel to the orange pipe running away, that is the water power hose coming from the surface. So water is pumped out of the sea through a water pump down this blue hose. It goes into a 90 degree turn causing a venturi and creates suction up the gray pipe. And this suction is nothing like an airlift, it's very gentle. The idea here is we're not digging, we're slowly removing the sediment disturbed as delicately as with a paintbrush to have visibility to see what's being exposed as the seabed is removed centimeter by centimeter. So everything is all under control. At the bottom of the picture, kind of running from left to right underneath the CCR diver at the back there, you see a white stripe. This is the 50 meter long centimeter marked archeological tape measure. And we ran it from the rudder to the bow on day one as our central datum line to do all other measurements from. Now here um, we have a electronic survey of the same site. And I just what I wanted to show you is you see just to the left of the red arrow, there's three timbers that make the shape of a letter A. And then right over to the left, you can see that same hawser again with the circular hole in it. We just flick backwards to the hand-drawn map. It's quite incredible that letter A of three timbers and that hawser, how similar this is. And this is absolutely amazing because this is done by sophisticated electronic equipment the darker blue areas being the deeper water and the um, green areas being the shallow water. So we really have um, incredible accuracy from the scientists who actually did this drawing first of all. I'm just gonna slow down a little bit because I think I'm talking a wee bit fast because I forget that you're translating. So thank you for that. Um, what we also had on the job was the ability to mark each artifact that was found exactly where it was on the seabed. So here we have on the corner of the um, scaffold frame, the underwater components of the US um, data logging system. So this enables us to actually log by GIS and by satellite the exact position of something underwater. The scientist would have an iPad in an underwater housing that you can still use touchscreen with. Um, with a tool, a pen. And as an artifact was found from beneath the mud, before it was moved, it was photographed, it was drawn by hand. Um, if applicable, it was then photogrammetrically modeled in 3D and it was logged on the iPad exactly where it was. And the iPad talked to these senders. These senders talked to transponders on the surface on buoys. They then were in contact with satellites and that was in contact with the computer system on the SWAN with the uh, digital data processor from Lund University. So again, really amazing, um, really incredible technology to pinpoint what was going on. So I don't uh, talk in the videos just because on previous webinar, we had some uh, issue with talking and video together. So I'll let the videos play. There's not so many of them, but you saw there a journey around the archeological grid, the various data transmitters from US on the corners of the grid, and you get a good idea of the visibility. Um, this was our August, September main project and we had really good visibility considering um, you could easily see the whole of the trench. You could see quite significant distance away along the timbers and it made our work significantly easier.
So there you have the whole site um, displayed through photogrammetry. And this is something that has moved on in technology dramatically over the last couple of years. Originally, if you wanted a map of the whole site, you took many photographs, got them developed, and then tried to line them up. And then it was made possible to use a computer to stitch them together. And this uh, particular model was done over several days with many thousand photographs by Brett Seymour, who is the uh, stills photographer and photogrammetry expert for the United States National Park Service Submerged Cultural Resources Unit. And he's been involved in many of the projects I've worked on doing artifact photography, site photography, and photogrammetry. You saw during that play of the photogrammetric map, the detail, you can even see the one centimeter wide archeological tape running the whole length of the wreck, the blue hydraulic hose bringing water down to the water dredge, and even a diver on site where you've basically actually got um, one of the divers was filming one of the artifacts on the bottom and he was able to basically end up in the model because he was laying still for long enough as the photographer went over. Now, remember said earlier, we don't dig. And you can see here exactly how the scientists work. John Adams, again, in this particular picture, he basically is uh, using a paintbrush to just very, very gently stroke away the seabed. And then the dust rises up and is sucked away by gentle suction from the water dredge. So it's quite impressive, um, basically, to watch him work. Bear in mind, he's hanging upside down from the scaffolding as well. And this enables nothing to be missed. Some of the artifacts found are incredibly delicate, very small, easily missed. And if they were sucked up the tube and blown out the other end, at the very least, they would be damaged and more likely be lost. So it's a gradual, slow process. The other thing that Professor Adams is amazing at is they draw everything they find. Although we now have Brett Seymour and other people giving us excellent uh, videography and photogrammetry and stills photography, um, the archaeologists like to draw. And when I talked to Professor Adams about why, he said, well, it's how I remember. It's almost like if I stay there as he is on the picture on the right and draw what I'm looking at, it sends it into my brain and it's there forever. But what amazed me was um, you see here on the left is his drawing. And you know how it is to try and write a message to your buddy on your wet book or your slate. It looks like terrible writing always because your hands are cold. And he manages to draw to this graphical detail underwater, um, hanging upside down. And he basically keeps each one for his journal and reproduces them for, for books. So what we uh, basically have here is the dendrochronology taking place. So we were given permission to remove a section of main ship's timber. And this is quite a thick chunk of wood. Many of you are rebreather divers and know that you shouldn't uh, really have to um, uh, cut away at uh, things and work hard while on rebreather. But this we had to saw off the wreck um, with a handsaw. So we elected to return to open circuit for this working dive with two of the um, guardians or commercial divers doing this job. But what enabled them to do was get full dendrochronological data from the timbers to determine um, age, exact age, and also um, exactly where they grew, which forests they were felled from. The interesting thing at the time with early shipwrights and early shipbuilders was what they actually would do often is walk around the forest and look for a particular tree and say, okay, this tree is the right shape for the keel or the bowsprit or something else. And sometimes they would even um, encourage trees to go in certain directions to get the right shape piece of wood for what they needed it for in the wreck. So real artistry. Our main um, archeological team, in addition to Dr. Brendan Foley from Lund was Krum Bakroff, who's Associate Professor of Maritime Archaeology at the University of Connecticut. Johan Ronby, who's Professor of Maritime Archaeology at Soderton University. And Professor John Adams, Maritime Archaeology at Southampton University. And John's at the front of the picture there. Um, Grum is in the middle. And uh, Johan Ronby is at the, uh, the back there. Johan is the uh, main site archaeologist for the Mars Project. So he's involved in both of these um, shipwrecks in Swedish waters um, of approximately uh, 
100 years apart, just, just, just under 100 years apart, but very related in their history. So we really did have some incredible archaeologists to piece together what was going on. As we started to dig down into uh, the wreck, we basically started to hit cargo. And what we have here is barrels. Now, these barrels would have contained what the sailors needed for food, for water, for provisions, and maybe also for armament, things like gunpowder. You can see the base or the bottom of a barrel there uh, underneath the paintbrush with Professor Adams to the left. You can see the base of the barrel with a measure on top of it for scale. And you can see the upright staves of the side of the barrel. Now at this time, modern barrels are built and a metal band is slid down over the staves to push them together so tight that the barrel becomes watertight. In early times, the metal band wasn't possible so they would tie them together with what's called withies, which is thin sections of tree root, um, while wet, and then let them dry, which would make them shrink and pull these barrel staves together to make the barrels waterproof. So on our ancient shipwrecks, like the Antikythera mechanism wreck we worked on, the cargo container was amphora. On the and the cargo container was the barrel. And something of interesting, if you look around the barrel bottom there, you can see um, little pieces of gray stone, like gravel or, uh, or dust or sediment. We'll come back to those later because they turned out to be quite important from the history of the ship. Here is um, the barrel lids. You can see uh, there were many, many of them on the bottom and we didn't need to lift or recover and conserve every one. Many were reburied back in the site in the trench at the end of the project but some fine examples were lifted. And this one here with myself in the left picture and on its own on the right, you can see it has a symbol branded on it by Burnmark. And also there are symbols scratched in it, maybe of content. You can also see in the right picture, if you look carefully at the peak of the, what looks like a letter A of branding, a little um, wooden peg that enabled it to be removed and to test the barrel to make sure the water or whatever was inside was in good condition. And here we have a video of recovery of that artifact. So what we did, we made an improvised stretcher. You can see the little peg moving there. It was uh, removed and kept safe. And the diver's best friend, Bungie. And these artifacts were so delicate, it was decided it was better to lift by hand the delicate parts rather than put them in bags to use airlifts or something along these lines. Of course, as a good Polish audience, you're probably pleased to see that all the commercial divers are wearing Santi. We wouldn't really wear anything else. Uh, so they looked after us very well with this project and uh, many others. But what was really interesting is that once the barrels were an analyzed and they're able now through the uh, biological department of Lund University to take a swab from the wood of the barrel and determine what was in that barrel. A barrel is just like now we have a tin. In a tin, there might be tomatoes. In a tin, there might be peaches. It's just a tin. It's used for carrying many things. And in Roman times, the amphora was the same. Everyone thinks, oh, amphora, wine. But they carried everything from fish paste to grain to water to wine, all sorts of things. And the barrel was the same. And in one of the barrels, we found these bones on the left. And of course we thought, okay, they're bones from food. But when they went to the biological department of the uh, University of Lund, the um, scientists working in the lab got really, really excited and said, these are sturgeon bones. And the sturgeon on the right there is not from the wreck. It's uh, in the 
museum. Uh, it's a preserved example of a sturgeon, but these are big fish with almost like armor plate scales, um, delicious to eat and a very big delicacy, sort of thing the king would eat and, and the uh, aristocracy, the rich people. But they're now extinct in the Baltic. And uh, so we've got basically a ship sunk in the Baltic, owned and potentially uh, the king was on board with sturgeon, a luxury food uh, for the aristocracy in one of the barrels. And what went further from there is once she started to analyze the bones, not only were the bones in this barrel sturgeon, but it was one sturgeon in that one barrel. So basically they found an entire sturgeon skeleton inside that barrel on that ship that was, uh, was, was basically the king's flagship of that fleet. And then this is an example of how we gradually find things. So here we're basically using the delicate suction of the water dredge to move away the sediment, a little bit of hand fanning, a little bit of paint brushing, just to lift the dust so you can see what lies beneath. And each area is lowered centimeter by centimeter, very small amounts. If you see something like this, and there are two artifacts here, um, just to the left of the cylinder in the middle, you can see sticks. Well, these are more important than sticks. They're actually woven basket, woven from natural fibers from tree roots. So basically handcrafted baskets for food, for bread, for something like this. And then obviously in the center of the photo is the cylindrical object with some sort of marking on it as well. Now, when they're found, the tendency might be to get excited and reach in and pull this out to see what it is, but then you've ruined the context. You've ruined the timeline of why it's there. If it's something that you can identify, what else nearby relates to it? Is this specific to a special area of the ship? So here we have a cylindrical object, a woven basket and a barrel with a fish in it. We're probably somewhere close to the food store, to the galley area maybe. And this is the sort of timeline you need. When this was found, it was logged on the iPad to the US system. It was photographed static. It was drawn, it was measured, and then it was photogrammetrically modeled before the next centimeter was taken down and down and down. And eventually it was able to be removed. And what it was, was a, a drinking flagon, a drinking vessel with a hinged lid. The hinge was leather. The lever has rotted away, but the lid's still there. We still have the lid. And what they found when they analyzed this at the university is it was made from a single piece of wood. Now there were no laves at this time other than um, pedal powered with rope, something like this, no machinery. So this was crafted and it has the mark um, of the king on it. So we're, we're starting to get into really important artifacts at this area of the ship. And then one, one day we found this, which was really, really exciting because to put it in perspective, this little circle that has uh, the glint of gold, it isn't gold, it's uh, some sort of alloy, but it's about the size of your thumbnail. So it's tiny. Can you imagine a little bit too much suction on that water dredge. This could have disappeared up the tube, out onto the seabed, never to be seen again. And you can probably see, especially at the top, if you think of it as a clock at the 11 and the one o'clock positions, um, very clear symbols. Um, the one on the two o'clock position almost looks a little bit like a bird. And again, moving on to the technologies we have available to us, we were then able to move on and find out what this was. In 2006, when they did a test trench, one of the things they brought up was chain mail. And you can see the chain mail in the main picture here. Now this was, royal dress chain mail. It's made of a softer, beautiful metal, not so good for being hit with a sword. Um, so it was dress mail that the king would have worn, um, you know, not in the thick of battle. But being the king, his mail was made to the finest possible degree of craftsmanship. And the craftsmen at that skill level were permitted to put their mark on what they made. And you can see in the smaller picture, a replica example of what we have in the previous photo. This is a maker's mark. Like if you look at something now made of silver, there are symbols on the bottom of a silver object, like a jug or a cup called a hallmark, saying where that silver come from, who made it, etc. So this, when uh, CT scanned at the university, all of the symbols showed up and it actually says Ulrich Führer, 
meaning Ulrich the Firemaker from Nuremberg. And Ulrich the Firemaker is in the archive documentation as the king's metallurgist and armorer. So we've really got context now. We found the royal chainmail marking disc from Ulrich Führer, who made armor for the king. So everything starts to piece together. You get the, the puzzle coming to the whole picture of what's going on. Now, it's not a, uh, it's not a treasure hunt. We don't go looking for, for valuables. We're in, looking for history to put in a museum to share with everyone for, for time perpetual. But we did find coins. And interestingly, these small coins were found in a, the remains of a small leather pouch with a drawstring together. Um, in the area of the galley. So maybe they were just the, the galley master's coins to pay for provisions when the ship came into dock. The beauty of archaeology is there's lots of maybe, 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 and hypothesis of what is it. You can see here a very high detailed scan of the coin. And from the scan, you can look beneath the concretion. The coins in the palm of the hand on the right look like black cookies, chocolate cookies. But when you look through that concretion with the scanner, you can see the markings. And the lettering is M-O-N, M-A-L, M-O-I, E-N-S, meaning a coin of the city of Malmo. And there is a, a, a historical collector's example of the same type of coin next to the scan there uh, in the left-hand photo uh, to the right. So pretty impressive. And then within that leather purse or leather bag, was this. Now to the right, you see it as it was found. It, it looks like a lump of volcanic rock, a piece of stone, a piece of mud. But if you look carefully, you can see circular shapes within it. And in the old days of archaeology, this would have had to have been slowly pulled apart by using the appropriate chemicals to break down the concretion and bit by bit break it apart into what was inside. Now with the scanning technology available to the universities, we can look inside that block. And on the left there, you can see an entire clump of coins, the edges being visible coin by coin by coin. And there is a video which is too high a resolution to put into this keynote, but you can see the scan going through that block coin by coin and reading each face as it goes. So it's just amazing, mind blowing. And what's impressive, for me, as a diver, with this project, as opposed to other projects I've been involved with, is all of this research um, from the finding of Ulrich the Firemaker, from scanning the coins, from dendrochronologically analysing the timbers and the bones in the barrel to be sturgeon, we got out of the water the middle of September last year. We're now in uh, May this year. So in, in little more than six or seven months, the archaeological research is going on um, immediately because the project was funded backwards. Museum space, conservation and research, diving backwards. So you're not left with a lot of stuff and not knowing what to do with it. Here's an example of that basket we talked about. Um, on the uh, right there in the wreck, full of sediment, full of debris, but you can clearly see the side of the basket and the base. And in my hand there on the left hand shot, the base of a basket hand woven from tree roots 500 years ago intact. Each artifact we would put in a zip seal bag, in the bag would go an artifact tag. The artifact had already been logged by the iPad on the GIS system, on the US system. So we had data exactly where it was, where it came from. And then being as this was a ship of war, the king's ship, we started to find weaponry, which was anticipated and hoped for, but it started to come out. The first item we found was shown um, in two photos there on the right, immediately after recovery on the sled, uh, the stretcher that was used to lift it from underwater and photographed um, high resolution after recovery uh, above. And we thought it was a crossbow. And again, talking about context, one of the reasons we thought it was a crossbow um, including the archaeologist who was working on the site and myself were the two people to find it, next to this item was a crossbow bolt, very obvious. Um, so you think, right, okay, well, here is the, uh, the stock and the main section of the crossbow. Next to it is a crossbow bolt. We found the crossbow. But when it came to the surface, one of our um, other 
archaeologist, Ralph Warman, who was basically a combat archaeologist specializing in ancient weaponry, looked at these holes in the upper photo to the right and said, this is not a crossbow, this is an arquebus. And an arquebus is basically a small handheld cannon, um, normally fired from the hip, not the shoulder. The power of this and the size of it would probably dislocate your arm if you tried to fire it like a modern rifle. And they grew and evolved to eventually have a spike on them that could go in a hole on the side of the ship to become like early swivel guns. And they were literally filled with bits of old metal, nails and nastiness, gunpowder and designed to cause maximum damage to the Marines on trying to board your ship from their ship. Here are some examples of shot that was found around the wreck from different sizes or calibers of arquebus and from different sizes of uh, breech loading guns, such as the carriages you saw. On the left there, a fairly large one, about the uh, size of a golf ball in my hand. And then on the right, a much smaller one from an arquebus or a smaller weapon um, around the site. And you can imagine seeing this as you're excavating is, is quite difficult. Same color as the sediment, hard to spot. And then we did find an actual crossbow. So this is a, the main section, central section of a crossbow. Archive drawings there of the type of crossbow we're looking at. And looking at how research has gone on very rapidly, considering we got out of the water mid-September, already they have taken this um, after dendrochronological analysis to a medieval weapons specialist in Sweden, and he has reproduced it. So this is built from that original. It was scanned via photogrammetry. It was then three-dimensional modeled. It was then 3D printed. And from, from the 3D print, he was able to replicate the crossbow from Gribschunden um, to a working condition where one of the Swedish Olympic archery squad teams was able to fire it, test fire it. And you'll see in the picture on the left there, the little tool, the little thing in front of it is for cocking it. There's too much power in this to cock it by hand. So this tool would pull the bow string back. Um, the bolt was put in place and it would fire a devastatingly deadly weapon. So the research going into this, the idea is the museum in Ronneby where this will all be displayed is gonna be interactive, a modern era museum. Uh, virtual reality headsets with the rec tour from the photogrammetry, um, reconstructed weaponry, um, enabling people to really hands-on experience what this was all about. And here's the photogrammetry scan. And this is actually of the arquebus to enable everything to be 3D printed for research and for museum use. So people at the museum, children, etc., can pick these things up, touch them, feel them, rather than everything just being in glass cabinets. So a real learning interactive museum is the goal. And we remember earlier, we talked about this, this gravel, these small stones around the barrels. Well, we, we at first didn't really know what it might be. We thought it was cargo, something inside the barrels of no idea. But then we began to realize from looking at uh, uh, archive research of other ships that what this was, you're probably all familiar that ships to be good in the water have to carry ballast or weight to make them sit correctly. And obviously when they're loaded with cargo, they carry less ballast. When they empty the cargo, they carry more ballast. A lot of early ships carried big rocks the size of footballs or rugby balls as ballast, but uh, they're very difficult to move around at sea and they're very difficult to position cargo amongst. So if you look at as a, one example of a, an earlier ship, um, the HMS Victory in Portsmouth in the UK, um, Nelson's ship, they used this gravel as ballast because firstly, if you needed to move it to trim the ship at sea, you could move it by shovel, by spade, very easily. And secondly, you could make it shaped so the barrels sat in it to stop them rolling around. So it's an excellent choice of ballast, a gravel rather than large stones. And there would be several thousand kilos of this in the bottom of the ship uh, to go amongst the cargo, the barrels, etc. And here we have a really nice image, um, black and white to get the definition, taken by Brett Seymour of the side of the ship. And what they discovered was there are two uh, main types of ship construction, clinker and carvel. And this period, 1495, was around about the time when they were starting to change from one to the other. And what they found as they excavated further down the Gribschunden is that Gribschunden is very, very unique because she's almost like a hybrid. It's like now we have 
petrol and electric cars that charge themselves and can run electric or petrol, Gripshinden was almost like a hybrid using some components of clinker build, some components of carvel build. So a very unique piece of ship architecture history. And what we have here, um, I'm the diver in this picture and I'm hovering um, with my fins pretty much over the keel, the middle and lowest point of the ship down here. And what we see here is the side of the ship, which was in two sections. And what she's done is she's just broken and fallen flat. So whereas, for example, the Mary Rose landed on the seabed on her side, the top half or one side of the ship rotted away and was taken by current. The buried half in the sediment has survived and is now in the Mary Rose Museum. Here, she broke her back, fell flat. The sediment has settled over her, so all of her is there. The entire Gribschenden, bow stern, port starboard, right down to the keel, is on this site, buried underneath that mud. So as permissions continue, as the project continues year by year, we were supposed to be back there August, September this year. If we're lucky, that may still happen, but with the COVID restrictions, we're likely to have to move this year's project to next year and beyond. And at the moment, the project aim is to remove all of the artifacts from the ship because the museum space and conservation funding can handle those. Whether in the future, especially because of her unique clinker carvel hybrid build, she is lifted as a whole and reassembled as such as the Vasa was, such as the Mary Rose was, is unknown, but it would be something very special if that could happen. And here's another view of the same, but from above. So you can really get an appreciation using the diver for scale there of the size of these timbers. They're like tree trunks. And remember this huge one in the forward left of the picture is not the keel. This is halfway up um, the, uh, in this case, the um, starboard side of the ship. And so it's a massive timber with the other pieces slotted into it through um, chiseled holes. The keel is further down out of this picture to the left and would be even bigger, quite literally a shaped tree trunk. And it's a good view as well of the archeological trench, the scaffolding, you'll see the scaffolding legs are on wooden boards. The wooden boards are sitting on top of sandbags. So there's a lot of padding underneath this trench because everything underneath you is wreckage. Some delicate artifact like the drinking vessel could be under it. So we give the maximum footprint possible to the trench um, grid. And also on top of that, it's slightly buoyed. So it's not very negative. It's just negative to stop it moving. And here we have uh, Johan um, with the end of the water dredge just excavating down among those timbers. And the last uh, slide, I'll turn the slides off in a moment so we can uh, take some questions if anybody has any. It's a little bit of fun. Um, on our April dive, the recon dive last year in April, I took a GoPro and I got some shots of uh, Dr. Brendan Foley swimming around the site. So the diver at the top of this graphic is actually my photo of Brendan on his JJ. And then they've basically drawn over it with kind of animation software to make the photo look more like a cartoon. And if any of you have ever seen the, uh, the original classic Jaws movie, the advert poster for the movie, the movie poster is this giant shark coming up with its mouth open and on the surface, the naked girl swimming, uh, which is basically the start of the film Jaws. So we thought we'd parody that with the, the Griffin Hounds open moor coming up to grab Dr. Brendan Foley because the actual Griffin dog has a human head in its mouth. And we thought that might be Dr. Brendan Foley um, if he didn't behave well on the project. And this became the unofficial team logo, the dive team, the archeologists, the scientists all wore this t-shirt around the site. Uh, and it's just a, a little bit of fun that we, we had at the end. So uh, thank you very much for listening. I'll just, uh, Try and turn off these slides now and then hand back over to the, the crew, to Michael, to pass on any questions if there's any out there. Hey, Phil, thank you for, for amazing presentation. Uh, we have quite a few questions to you. I will start with a short warm up question. You okay. mentioned in your presentation that you are actually not looking for treasures, but more history. But have you ever found a real treasure? 
Uh, yes, I, um, I've worked on um, the, what's called the Atosha Project. So there's a very famous treasure hunter called Mel Fisher. Mel's uh, no longer with us. He passed away, sadly. But his company is still working in the Gulf of Mexico um, off the end of Key West in Florida, um, right out by a bird sanctuary called Marquesas Key, where two of the original uh, 1560s Manila galleons sunk, which were carrying uh, silver and gold from the New World, from, from, uh, from Central America, uh, back to Spain for the wealth of, of the Queen of Spain at the time. So when I worked there, that was not archaeology, that is treasure diving. Uh, we use a 14-inch airlift run by a road compressor, and you dig. And basically, we found barrel after barrel after barrel of silver coins, um, gold coins, gold money chain. Um, if you're ever lucky enough to go to the Keys in Florida, go to the very end of the Keys to Key West and go and visit the Atosha Museum, because many of the finest artifacts uh, are on display to the public and the true story. So, yes, I have I have worked on real treasure jobs. Thank you for that one. So, um, obviously, we have quite a few divers listening to, to that, and they are interested about what are the biggest diving-related challenges to those archaeological projects. Um, for this project, it was fairly simple because the site was just uh, nine or 12 meters deep. Um, every diver had redundant equipment. So you notice they were diving uh, twin sets, dual, dual first stage, dual second stage. Every diver had a guardian. The rebreather divers, of course, had bailout and were very, very shallow. Even the longest profiles were no decompression. But um, this system we have called the guardian system was originally put together um, uh, by actually by myself, I, I designed it for the Antikythera mechanism shipwreck, where we worked with the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute archaeologists, with the Greek Ephra of Antiquities from the Greek Ministry, with the US National Park Service divers. And we were working on the Antikythera mechanism shipwreck, which sits between 45 and 70 meters of depth. And our goal was not to let just divers do the underwater work bring back photos, video, drawings, and reports, and be told by the scientists what to do the next day. Our goal was always to put um, PhD archaeologists on the wreck for the whole bottom time working, doing their job, because then the experts are seeing what's happening live and changing the next step live. So what we did, we started from scratch. We basically looked at the project, looked at the proposed team, of archaeologists, looked at their current diving qualifications, and then we trained them. Um, in this case, we trained them on CCR, first the level one, uh, then the level two, and that was deep enough for this project. We then um, booked uh, an amount of time per year for simply training and hour logging trips because these guys are professional archaeologists, they don't dive for fun. So we'd book them for a week of training, another week of training, another week of training, and then just before the project, a final week of training, then each one got a guardian. So we'd make them ready for the site. So that was probably the, the biggest logistical difficulty for me as supervisor was to get um, fairly basically qualified divers who were phenomenally qualified archeologists, professors, and doctors to be able to safely be on all the sites we work, the Tulsa American, at 40 meters, the Antikythera mechanism shipwreck, an average of 50 meters, and other wrecks that we're, uh, we're working towards now. So you actually answered part of the next question about the guardian's role, but mm -hmm. can you describe your role as a dive safety officer in such a project? Uh, yeah, certainly. So I have, um, we say in English, many hats. When I'm on these projects, I have this hat, this hat, this hat, and I have to change them each uh, each day. But as dive safety officer, I, I'm basically the, the end result of whether we go diving or not. So I'm, I'm basically the, the highest position person above the archaeologists, above the financer, above everybody. If, if I say, no, it's not safe, we're not diving, we don't dive. And that is my main job, to risk assess each diving day, the each diving week, each project that needs to be done and the entire mission uh, to make each dive safe. And little, little examples, if we find a large artifact that needs lifting, 
it's left on the bottom at the end of the day when all the scientists are out of the water and normally they've gone back to shore on the support boat then the commercial divers um, my my guardian team will do one final dive to rig and lift that item or we'll have divers in reserve who've not dived that day so no decompression problem on the deeper sites they will rig and lift that item so you never run the risk of a lifted item falling and landing back on a diver on the bottom and of course because we're working with water dredges and other underwater machinery there's all the risk assessment of keeping that safe so it's uh i guess the 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 joke description is the dso is a a massively um overqualified babysitter that's 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 very interesting role um so next next question is to 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 that wreck that you were describing you said that it's still not finished all the archaeological work around that but um what about the other wrecks you were working on are they available for diving when the scientific work is over yeah so also a very good question um the the uh, the Tulsa American is a B24J bomber um, it's uh, on the island of Viz in Croatia. Uh, the wings, um, engines, and the nose section, um, a, a pilot and co-pilot's position, and the nose gun are at 40 meters on top of a, a, a seamount. The tail section um, and the main fuselage and the bomb bay and the, the guns from the waist and the guns from the, the tail are at 50 meters just off of the wall. And this is a, one of the most regularly visited um, technical and rec deep recreational sites on the island of Viz. All of the dive centers there take people to it. One of our missions when we did that project was we literally had to disassemble the wreck to find the pilot, but we were tasked with the mission of reassembling the wreck afterwards, leaving it in as good or better condition for divers as it was when we found it and we achieved that. Um, the Antikythera site, that if you went for a dive there, if I took you for a dive there tomorrow, there is nothing there. The entire wreck is buried under uh, 2,200 years of earthquake activity, rock fall, sediment, um, and deposition. So everything found on that site is, is excavated out of deep seabed. So when the divers can go and dive there, the free divers and spear fishermen often do, but there's nothing at all to see and there's no need to hide it. Um, Gribschunden was found by a sport diving or recreational diving club. Um, and at, uh, you're, you're not allowed to take or dig, um, but there's no real like exclusion zone on site. So a lot, a lot of our sites um, are, are not protected day in, day out. Other sites are, lots in the UK are, the Mars wreck definitely is. Um, Gribschunden maybe as we stop digging trenches and start to work on the entire hull, then there may be a protection on site. So it varies from site to site and it varies how things change after the, the work is finished. Thank you. And, and you mentioned this B-24 Tulsa American bomber from this island. And I wanted to, to ask something more about that because that's, that's, the wreck, uh, that's the wreck that probably lots of our Polish listeners have a possibility to visit or they visited already. You mentioned that you dis assemble it and then um, assemble it again. Can you tell us a bit more about that project? Yeah, sure. We, um, the, the American government and the American military have an organization called the DPAA. That's the Defense POW, Prisoner of War, MIA, Missing in Action, um, Accounting Agency. And their job is to find uh, American soldiers, sailors, and airmen who fell in any war um, conclusively to find um, osseous or bone remains to take DNA from them and match them to the families and send these heroes back to their family for a proper burial uh, and closure for those families and a military ceremony at the military cemetery Arlington in, uh, in, in the US. And basically we, because we had experience of working with ancient skeletal remains on Antikythera, were approached by the DPAA to, to be the contractor for this particular job. The Tulsa American B-24 uh, ditched in the sea, um, trying to do an emergency landing on the Viz runway, 
because she was uh, damaged by German fighter aircraft, Messerschmitts and Fokker-Wolfs, while bombing oil refineries in Germany, and she couldn't make it all the way back to her own air base in southern Italy, so she elected to ditch on Viz. She didn't make it to the runway, she ditched in the sea, and because of the nature of B-24s, she, she dis disintegrated when she hit the water, but, but got ripped in half. And so we were, were, were uh, tasked with recovering um, as many of the missing crew as possible. Seven survived, three were lost. Um, at least one was reported by eyewitnesses as being thrown clear of the wreckage. So we were really looking for two, uh, the pilot and the co-pilot, who would be inside the wreckage. So when I say disassemble, we had a very unique, very local area of the aircraft, the pilot, co-pilot, seating and cockpit area, to just remove all the tangled metal down, down, down to the seat, uh, the armoured seat bucket that the seat sat within, the control column position, all of this area, uh, looking for bone remains that could be sent to the DPAA's laboratories in Hawaii for really extensive DNA analysis. The families of the free missing crew from this wreck were then able to give DNA samples from themselves, from blood relatives. And when matches were achieved, then those heroes could go back to their families for, for burial. And uh, we managed to find the pilot, um, Lieutenant Eugene Ford, um, a very conclusive find, most of his skeleton, his wedding ring and his flight wings. And he got a full honours burial, military honours burial at Arlington, and his family got to bury him in the home churchyard and his family got his wedding ring and the flight wings back. So it was a very, very emotional, rewarding uh, job um, that was done as a combination of our team and the Croatian Navy and the DPAA. Thank you. This gives us really interesting background when we go diving there. We can't wait to, to, to go to Croatia and dive those wrecks. Um, last question. Uh, and this is why do you need to, to do those hand drawings with the availability of the photogrammetry nowadays? Um, we don't need to. Uh, the, the, I think I try, tried to explain on the slide, but I'll re-explain here a little bit. The, the professors and the doctors, they publish um, academic papers on each project and on each aspect of the project. The bigger projects like Mars, Mary Rose and Gribschenden will fall into this category. Those published papers normally end up becoming a book. And you can't put photogrammetry in a book. Um, I'm 51 and I love books. I love to open a book about shipwrecks, like the shipwrecks of Truck Lagoon, of Scapa Flow, of Narvik, and read what happened, read uh, references to the diaries and journals of the people who were there, who survived, and see pictures of, of what took place. Of course, um, I'm, I also love to look at the photogrammetry and the video and the, uh, the GIS data, but the, the professors and the doctors like the hand-drawn drawings to put into their papers in conjunction with the technology, because not all the technology can be presented on paper. On top of that, what I tried to explain was um, Professor Adams, who is quite literally wrote the book on ship architecture for archaeology. He said to me, he said, basically, if I go down and look at it, I come back and I've really got a struggle to remember what I saw. And in three years time, when we're still carrying the research, it won't be really clear in my head. If I sit down there for 90 minutes and draw every piece, then it's like the drawing process of using my eyes and my brain and my hand loads that information into my head, like loading data onto a computer, and it's there for life. That was John's description of why he draws. So hopefully that answers the question. Okay, Phil. Thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. It's always great to see that, you know, passionate people are sharing their knowledge and experience with us. So once again, I really, really uh, appreciate that, that you, you, you just spent the time and, and decide to help us and join your knowledge and with your presentation. I hope we see each other next time, hopefully diving, hopefully in Poland maybe. <laughs> Anytime you would like to come here, just, Drop us the message, you are very welcome. And one more time, thank you for your perfect presentation. Thank you for inviting me and you're very welcome. Okay, stay safe, stay healthy, stay in touch.
Take care. No dobrze, moi drodzy, więc to na tyle. Myślę, że mogę już wyłączyć opcję tłumaczenia, bo jest nam niepotrzebna. Mam nadzieję, że prezentacja wam się podobała. Mam nadzieję, że ten czas spędzony przed telewizorem czy przed komputerem w zasadzie uznacie za niestracony. Mi się to na przykład bardzo podobało. Takie historie uwielbiam o odgrywaniu wraków i, i tego, co się za nimi działo. Więc po raz kolejny bardzo chciałbym podziękować naszej ekipie tłumaczy. Bez nich byśmy sobie nie poradzili, a wam byłoby trudniej to zrozumieć. Także jeszcze raz Michał Piotrek, wielkie, wielkie gratki, wielkie podziękowania za waszą pomoc, więc mam nadzieję, że jeszcze będziemy mieli okazję współpracować. A to na dzisiaj to tyle. Dziękuję wam bardzo za uwagę. Poproszę jeszcze Michała, żeby opowiedział wam o naszej kolejnej prezentacji. Warto myślę wspomnieć, że zarówno tłumacze Michał Piotrek, jak i wszyscy prezenterzy wspierają tą akcję charytatywnie, więc tym bardziej, tym bardziej bardzo, bardzo dziękujemy. Zainteresujcie się. Tym bardziej kliknijcie ten link poniżej i wesprzyjcie naszą akcję. <śmiech> dokładnie, <śmiech> dokładnie tak. A m, najbliższa prezentacja to już w tą niedzielę o siódmej wieczorem będziemy mieli Johna Chattertona. John, możecie go kojarzyć z niesłychanie popularnej książki W pogoni za cieniem, e, napisanej przez Roberta Carsona. To był główny bohater tej właśnie książki. A nam w niedzielę o siódmej opowie o wraku SS Karolina, o tym jak go odnalazł u wybrzeży New Jersey. Więc zapraszamy w tę niedzielę o e, siódmej wieczorem. Prezentacja także będzie tłumaczona na język polski. Na dzisiaj to tyle. Dziękujemy bardzo za uwagę i do zobaczenia w niedzielę.